everybody. Welcome to the stream. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping and then we're going to get straight into the topic of this particular walkthrough stream. Stream should the stream is gonna basically be a, a relatively short walkthrough. I'm gonna try and keep it to about an hour on how to develop a 2D game engine using C Sharp and Win2D, the Win2D runtime. And um, uh, we're gonna be focusing on a topic or two. We're gonna be focusing on the uh, as the agenda says. I'll, I'll zoom in there in a hot minute. Uh, but we're going to be loading data or metadata to help us construct our scenes um, in a more dynamic way. Just gonna do a little bit of housekeeping. I should be slightly off screen, so you might not be seeing. I'm just I should be slightly off screen, screen, so you might. Well, you might see it. I don't think I think it's off screen because I'm not dual screening as I used to. This is my new setup uh, with my new PC that I bought a couple months ago or so. So it's a lot faster than the laptop behind me, um, but I've only got a single screen setup for now. This should be quite an interesting video, um, quite an interesting, interesting stream. Um, we're going to be talking about some fun stuff you can do with C-sharp. Also, do let me know in chat if the levels are okay. I'm using a setup whereby my phone is streaming to my PC. So if the levels are too quite too loud, let me know what I'm clipping. This wouldn't take long, just about a minute. Sorry guys for this. Okay, so that housekeeping is done and um, We shall soon get straight to the agenda. So this is my first time using this particular setup in terms of the configuration of the um, OBS. So in this particular manner, in a way, so I'm still getting used to it. So sorry that I'm looking to the off screen as my T is there, but um, uh, uh, we'll get to the coding in a hot minute. Let me just make sure I'm doing this right. Oh, and my screen, uh, yeah, it probably has gone black. Uh, my computer will be a little bit slow. It's not the fastest in the world. Um, it's not the fastest machine in the world, so hopefully it will, it will still do better than when I used to stream on my laptop over there, but uh, hopefully we won't get too many hitches. Uh, I am a residency, so uh, if there's any interruptions, I'll just uh, post a stream or something, uh, but it should be fine. It's only going to be a short stream. And uh, yeah, so my name is Williams. Uh, let me just adjust the so you can see, I'll get rid of OBS there, and let me just zoom in actually, so yeah my computer is really slow but hopefully we'll just roll with it, it might crash, I don't know, it might not, <laughs> just zoom in so we can see the code a little bit easier, and yeah my name is Will, and um, uh, thanks for tuning in, so this is going to be quite a fun one, here's the agenda, so basically what, what do you want to do? So I want to walk through, as I do on this channel, uh, a tutorial of how to use C-Sharp, in particular Win2D, the Win2D library using C-Sharp. Uh, what is Win2D? Uh, we can go straight to the documentation to help us answer that question. Uh, I'm going to double check, make sure you, you can all see that. Yep, it's all good. I will zoom in on the page. So 
So Win2D, for those who may not know, is a easy to use Windows runtime API for immediate mode 2D graphics rendering with GPU acceleration. So it is actually available in C Sharp, C++, and VB, and it's supported by the UWP um, platform. But there is also a version of uh, Win2D, if I can find the bit that is supported by WinUI. So um, we're not going to be focusing on that particular version because I'm going to be focusing on the UWP um, Universal Windows platform, which I primarily is my kind of go-to platform for developing 2D games. So it's quite partial to C Sharp, and it's more, one of the more modern front-end framework, frameworks, even. So um, why use Win2D and C Sharp for 2D games development? Good question. So basically, obviously, the... <sighs> It's a broad question, and it will probably always be debated and always be spoken about, um, you know, what is the best engine framework or approach to developing a 2D game. I'm not going to say this is the best approach. I'm not going to say it's not so much the best approach. I'm going to say it's, it offers a great balance using a managed environment like C Sharp to code a video game, especially when the language has been around. It's quite tried and tested. It's been around for quite a long time. And um, the Win2D library sits on top. It leverages Direct2D APIs, so it is actually quite fast. During some of the demos we may go through here, um, you'll find that it might seem slow because of my recording software. My computer's under a bit of load. You might even hear it a little bit like a mini jumbo. <laughs> but um, when you're, when you're um, deploying it with no debug symbols, um, not much straining the CPU, then you don't really... Um, get the slowdown, but it may be pretty slow here, significantly so. But if you do check out some of my other videos on the channel, you'll see it on more of an APS speed, but that's not really relevant. It's more about what we're gonna learn. Also, I wanna go through some IO stuff. So uh, what can we do in terms of loading metadata? So we wanna build a framework. And what I'm doing is that I've already endeavored in building my Parallax engine. Do a short demo of it in a second. And as you may have seen from some of the other videos on my channel, it powers 2D graphics, uh, and you can control um, your scene uh, via uh, inputs such as the keyboard or uh, Microsoft controller PC support. So uh, let's see, maybe I'll run you through a short demonstration of what this, um, what this framework does at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me, just to let you know, the, um, the assets used for the graphics are really rudimentary. I basically composited the majority of the assets myself. I'm not a professional artist by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, so it's not going to look great, <laughs> but it will at least get the idea across. So um, hopefully, uh, I'll check the chat every now and then if there's anyone um, talking, just to see if there is... Um, Anything I need to take note of, perhaps like the sounds or the levels. But this is a really simple technical demonstration of just some of the functionalities of this engine. What I've done so far is uh, there's a layers of sprites on the screen. And we're going to dive, not dive into, say, the draw cores update loops and the um, resources. Because I, I have actually recorded a video on that and some of my other Winter videos have gone through that. But just as a quick gloss over, um, you can control this rabbit slash bunny, bunny rabbit, whatever you prefer, uh, across the screen. There is no um, gravity physics per se. I have the functionality built in, but I have uh, disabled it for this demonstration because I was working more on the matrix transform. As you can see, uh, there's this effect of um, perspective as you're going across the plane here. Uh, you can go off the plane because there's no physics. So as you saw, bunny was off screen so it's just on a layer it's not actually interacting per se with the scene um we have parallaxing background there i actually intentionally heavily pixelated that background to kind of do depth of view if you composite like um photoshop style effects and um like graphics rendering effects you can do a lot of neat stuff and this will just be messing around so that's why the background looks pixelated it's just i rendered it that way when i took it off paint.net what else is here? Uh, there is an editor layer which we'll go through in a in a minute or so, which we'll, we're gonna be focusing on because what this framework essentially does it powers the the game, so you will build the game on top of the framework, the C sharp code base, and it's extendable. Um, 
However, I did think to myself, would it not be quite advantageous and convenient to have an editor layer so that you don't necessarily have to 100% code in the, uh, in the IDE? And the answer is yeah, because I had this idea of if you load, say, basic XML style schemas that store metadata for your objects and load them at, at runtime, then that just means you can basically have a system where you are running this framework, um, you're making changes to the scene, you're saving that session via the UI when, you, when you're running it in debug or deployed mode, it will store the schema, i.e. all the metadata, so this platform is in X position 2, or this background layer is in X position 0, and then when you load the, the framework and load your session, that metadata, which you basically configured via the UI layer, is then loaded into the um, program, and then it's reconstructed. And I was initially going to do this via serialization, but the thing is, with UWP, is that it's um, quite heavily sandboxed in the sense that compared to its predecessor, WPF, as a flagship front-end framework, you don't have the unrestricted access that Win32 uh, gives you with WPF. Um, so what that just means is to circumvent some of the limitations of the security hurdles that are in place, rightly so, to prevent... Um, should I say, um, maybe malicious file access and hacking and stuff, you have to play Microsoft's game. So basically, what does that mean? You have to use the app manifest, usually, to declare um, app capabilities um, before you deploy, even run your app in debug environments if you have, like, unrestricted um, file capabilities uh, in your application. I tried to run... Uh, uh, I'll show you, actually. So I have this functionality, and I have to rename this class. I named it File.io. There is a standard um, namespace called File.io, and I need to change this to like Game File.io, or else it's going to be quite confusing for me. Basically, my initial uh, approach was to create this. I'm going to just double check to make sure we can all read that. Well, that doesn't help. <laughs> it's quite fine. I can just about see that. And um, uh, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, where was I? So, this um, piece of code, what it does, it, se it uses serialization to um, serialize an object. So the object target is saved onto an XML file, or in this case, a text file. And um, you can save all sorts of information in this text file. In this particular case, I have, I was targeting the app domain, current domain base directory, which is just the working directory of your application. Um, and then I made a folder called schemas under the assets folder. And then I made a text file called stage zero. And the idea was to basically pass, when you construct this class, you pass, um, what is it here, a list of rects. Um, I have on my channel some videos, a video or, or, or two, like a stream or something. I might have made it private, I'm not too sure, I might have to double check that because it, the stream was quite laggy. Um, the way this works is that with Win2D, and I'll go through it in a little bit more detail if, if needed, but we load these rect structs. And these rec structs act as bounds for assets on the screen. That's one of the most simplest ways I could approach drawing on the screen using bitmaps. By storing the bitmaps and presenting them in these rects, we can then um, um, put the rects in a list, in a collection, in a list, and uh, they can be um, access via their index. So what do I do here? When constructing this class file.io, which I need to change to like game file.io, um, so basically uh, you pass a list of rects, stage platforms is the parameter. And then I just basically assign the value of this global stage platforms to stage platforms pass through the parameter file.io, which is just a list of rects, right? And this list of rects holds every single rect in your screen that holds bitmap information. And that would be from, say, the bunny that you saw earlier or the background. That, that's, they're all in rects, in rect structs. Then this XML serializer is constructed and you pass the type of rect and using a text writer under system IO um, namespace, you can then create a stream writer, pass the, file, the target um, file directory where you want to store this text file with all the metadata, and then you just call the serialize, um, serialize uh, method, and you pass the overloads. So you pass a text writer and the object, which in this case is a list of, of, um, a list of rects. Uh, however, 
remember when I mentioned about the um, security hurdles and the um, sandbox nature of UWP? Uh, if I... I'll show you what happens. I think that might be even better. Hopefully my computer won't be too slow. I know I say that all the time. <laughs> Knowing that my computer is not the fun, but it's okay. I'm making excuses. Anyway, where am I? So I'm going to just look for the constructor of my framework or my project. Here where I'm loading load metadata, I'm going to just clear that for a second. In fact, let me just comment it out just so that I don't lose track of things. I'm going to call this constructed file.io file .io, not to be um, mistaken with the um, .NET. Um, I think it's a system namespace called uh, or class called file.io. This one, I just renamed it really bad. I need to change it so it's not confusing. But anyway, file.io. And then we're going to look at that serialized function that I, that I made. So what was it called? Serialized stages. Wow, my computer's really trying there. <laughs> so there we go. And so what I try, I'm going to load this without symbol loading. So without, so not in debug mode, technically, for the speed. Now, we should be technically met with an error message. I'd be surprised if there's not an error message, but we should be met with an error message. I did try to declare app capabilities um, via the application manifest, but I think I missed a few steps, like, um, a few parameters that you have to change or maybe I wasn't declaring the right properties, but um, uh, which would mean there should be an error when you try to invoke um, the class and methods and the members that come from the XML serializer um, class because it's basically a, a, a functionality that you have to fundamentally um, declare. I'm going to see if it works, I will be surprised because it didn't work earlier. Here we go. So we are met with this unable to activate. It's quite hard. I appreciate it's a bit hard to see on the screen, probably, but unable to activate Windows Store app. A bit of gibberish here, like a code. The activation request failed with error operation not supported. Now, again, this is not the end of the world. It, this kind of security, I, I take it this is the security, uh, an error message, which is fundamentally tied to the security of using a unrestricted or a need to be declared functionality of UWP. So basically, how did I kind of circumvent this kind of uh, situation? I just wrote another method, as you see, load metadata. And you know what we can do? Uh, let's go into my my file class that I made. Uh, save metadata, we're just gonna um, debug it. Let's have a look at what happens. I'll run it with simple loaded, i.e. debug mode. Just make sure I call the class properly. Load metadata. I didn't see a reference there. So let me just quickly check again. Probably because I didn't do something, it was just still updating. Save metadata. I'm just going to double check. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, there. So I'm going to load it with debugging. Check the stream. Sorry about that. And then, um, so basically, I cheated a little bit <laughs> because I've always confirm this functionality um, before the stream just to make sure things work kind of give myself a little bit of a head start um, so this part of the agenda use IO to store object metadata uh, I can once I show you guys the, the data that's been serialized then I will show you the data being deserialized from the from the file so I just had to think about if it will serialize again or not because I already serialized the file before but it will just place, um, serialize it the information again it's not any particular information it's just place all the strings that I put in there just to make sure that it works more or less uh, more or less there is one rect that I did from but I placed that functionality in the constructor just for deep purposes so as soon as the uh, app is loaded then I'm going to close it I'm going to call the deserialize oh, it's not even sorry do forgive me, I, I meant um, the loading. I'm not really using serialization per se. I'm using like system file IO functionalities because that, maybe I'll do the documentation. And by the way, the UI is really rough. <laughs> this is like the UI that I kind of put really quickly 
just give me an idea of how the editor could look. I'm still, it's like 1% there. Uh, there is a, a content dialog box, which I want to kind of make use of. Um, but this is the idea around the editor layer. You can basically tweak and configure the engine. And then you can, then there will be something like um, up here, file. I don't have anything saved, um, anything else here, but there'll be file, save session, and then you can load it. Now I'm going to close this. I'm going to put this out of the way. I'm going to just change the functionality. Oh, whoops. I actually called load metadata. So I didn't actually save it and I didn't debug it, but that should be fine. Let me call save metadata quickly. So nothing really saved on that system. Just to be on the safe side, I'll save metadata. So I'm calling save metadata. I'm going to close the app. Then I'm going to debug the um, load metadata function so we can just see what's going on there. This may take just like a minute. So, um, uh, so that's all well and good over there. I find the endeavor of um, creating an engine a very rewarding one. Um, I'm studying DirectX right now in C++, a particular DirectX 11, and it's a rabbit hole of fascination to me. Um, it's so much to learn about how to configure your game or engine using C++ and DirectX 11. And I was, you know, shiny object syndrome, as some, some may call it. I was quite interested by DirectX 12 APIs or the feature level DirectX 12 and coding in that. But uh, just as the M and a Microsoft would advice, I should be very comfortable, and I, sh I should probably emphasize very comfortable with DirectX 11 before I go on to even thinking about attempting DirectX 12. So I'm studying DirectX 11 at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and just close the session. Uh, I'm going to set a break on load metadata. So this is the um, syntax. So this is just like a general walkthrough, not really uh, every single line of code, but kind of a general walkthrough how I'm approaching this. Although there may be some techie, like, um, sexy bits, but uh, I am trying to keep, I'm just looking at the clock there, I'm trying to keep to the time, generally speaking. Okay, so I'll move back to the main page. Load metadata. I always have this time pressing Control S to save my sessions all the time. <laughs> anyway, let's go. So it's going to pop up OBS. I'm going to maximize the screen because I just want to do some stuff here. It's a bit harder when I am. Um, might not even make a difference because my window is probably going to pop up at the front. It doesn't matter. Don't mind. I just want to check the live stream. Oh, don't worry about that. I don't want to waste time as well. So what I'll do, I'll just minimize this. Make sure the notepad is down. I'm, I trust the stream is streaming and everything is fine. <laughs> uh, anyway, so here, yeah, load metadata. I'm just going to step through these fairly quickly because what we're interested in is this text. This text, is, I appreciate it's hard to see, but if you look quite carefully, this text has been assigned the value of Windows Storage File accessing the read text async function, which has put it in the overload this file object, storage file, which is an async function which is calling the get file async uh, method and as you can see there's a text file there called schema underscore one dot text this is stored in our current dot local folder directory which is actually hidden in the file explorer it's hidden for good reason because um, if you're storing to that folder you really want to expose it to um, your everyday users even your power users your app or your game it's for security but we do have access and UWP allows us to use access to access this file. May need to declare some capabilities, not too sure, but we have the access, unlike the error I got earlier when I tried to use the XML approach. And if you see, when we serialized um, some objects, <coughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Um, as you can see here, I serialized, the I keep saying serialized, I stored the lines, it might be a, essentially serialization under, underneath the hood, but anyway, I stored these the string lines one, line two, line three, and appended each line. Each each block of text here is appended by a new line via this append 
as async function. And if we go ahead and just highlight here, you can see, and you can even see on the debug bit that at the bottom, we have the number zero, which actually comes from here. Um, I, I basically stored the value of stage platforms, which is a list of rect. And I pass some just like placeholder rects in there, and they have an x value of zero. That's where um, this zero is coming from, as you see where the arrow is. Then there's a there's a append, a new line append, and you can see the text line one, line two, line three. We have just confirmed that we can store metadata and basically any kind of object data and load it on a completely bis um, discrete session. This is uh, this is great because it just means that we can then utilize an editor layer um, to edit the um, scene, at least store the metadata in some kind of um, schema, and then load that metadata and use it in a completely different session. All while, if you have access to the source code, you can still edit the engine and build a game on top of that. It's preference. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, just check out my agenda to see what's next. I'm going to mark that um, master of the agenda complete so we've gone through io to store metadata hopefully we can go through all of these today if not it will probably be in the next episode load metadata to reconstruct game editor session okay what do we want to do with this let's just let's just uh let me take it to the main page so I do uh, apologize if I assume some knowledge of Win2D already. I'm not going to go through like the very, very basic, stuff, like bare bone stuff, just because we don't have that much time. But what I've done to construct a very rough scene you saw with the bunny and like the hill background, that's all done via the code base. And I want to show you some kind of fun stuff I came up with. So I have the animated draw function, which is... Um, part of the Win2D um, library. And uh, what it does, it acts as like a, uh, it basically essentially um, functions as an update loop for draw calls. So you can all your drawing information uh, at runtime, all your drawing information in this method and it will load at runtime. And basically what I did, I have four local methods here, draw backgrounds, uh, draw foregrounds, apply world physics and pass player movement. And I place this in the animated draw function might be better in animated update. I do have an animated update, which does more or less the same thing, animate draw, but I don't have access to the draw, the, the same um, arguments. What's the name of the argument? Let me go back. The canvas animated draw events args argument, which actually gives me access to a neat little property called um, drawing session. In drawing session, you can access the draw image function, which you can then use to draw your bitmaps. But then I also have animate update, which does essentially the same thing as um, the animate draw, but you have a different event argument. If I can just go to animate update, I can't even find it. It's probably, I think it's up somewhere. I think I probably missed it. Uh, no check. Da -da -da. Oh, here it is. Sorry about that. Animate update has the canvas animated update event args. So you have a I haven't really gone extensively into this event arguments because all I'm doing here is just checking for controller inputs really to change certain states. But um, we have a whole set of functionalities here as well you can access. I haven't really explored it that much. Probably a lot of neat stuff I can do there. And I might as well uh, introduce you all to the um, create animated resource. This is where I'm loading all the bitmap information from disk onto memory. And um, it's not in the best shape because right now I'm doing everything or 90% of it is done line by line. I am using a for loop to kind of save time. Plus, I'm really taking take liberties because I said, traditionally what you do is have like, say you have a, a two megabyte sprite sheet with the bunny animations, all of, the, all of the animations there. And you import that. Ideally, what you want to do is to have, and I have, I do have some cr a cropping mechanism, but it's still, it's not finished yet. You want to crop this right in, in um, at runtime, so that to save on the um, disk space and memory space that you use to load the uh, sprite animations. I'm not being so ideal here because here, for example, 
if we look at say this one if we look here i am making a fork within the range of 0 to 22 inclusive now i'm accessing a directory that's called as the current domain um, accessing the base directory and i'm accessing assets the assets folder and the Reddit folder and this is for the stand animation i have essentially 20 frames of standing animation it's not great but i did this for the sake of time now that's not really the main point i want to bring to your attention the main point is that each of those um, frames um each of those frames is probably like give or take let's just say under a megabyte right but if i times that by 22 it it will probably be more than a sprite a single sprite sheet with 22 different images on that sprite sheet it's more efficient to load that than loading 22 individual sprites but that's what i'm doing here because it just works out a little bit quicker i was working on the um the cropping bitmap functionality but uh it didn't it's not working as yet so i just rolled with this way what i'm doing i am um assigning this canvas bitmap object which is basically an invocation of the um canvas bitmap class like i'm basically constructing the, the object instantiating it and i'm passing the bit the um the uh, bitmap information of this rabbit and you have index dot two strings so that it's given an index so in on the disk it's called rabbit zero all the way up to rabbit 20 from rabbit zero to rabbit 21 is the file name if that makes sense and i'm loading all of that via a loop and then obviously concatenate the png because the png images which is quite good because you do want to um, attain the alpha transparency values so i would i would recommend using png and I'm adding them to this player canvas bitmap list. So imagine, long story cut short, I have like 22 frames of animation, loading them in a collection, a list. And if you scroll down, that list is then accessed. Uh, let me see, am I using this one? No, I'm not using this one. Let's find a better example. So um, that was called player canvas bitmap list. If I go to draw, uh, not grounds, I think it's foregrounds. Let me just quickly check. Where are we using that? Where are we accessing that list? Let me just zoom out so it's a bit easier for me to find it. Because every time we call, for example, here, when I'm part in this function called pass player movement, I'm calling e dot drawing session draw image. And in this overload, you have to pass certain parameters. Let's see if I can just load up the IntelliSense. You basically have to pass, I think, a canvas bitmap, as you can see, hopefully, I know it's a bit hard to see, and a destination rect. So the canvas bitmap is the bitmap information memory storing your graphic. <laughs> Excuse me. And the rect is the rect struct that contains the bitmap information when it's displayed on the screen. So I went ahead and I made this function called animate sprites, which returns a canvas bitmap. And all this animate sprites does is that you pass a few parameters, as you can hopefully see, I know it's a bit small to see, a list of canvas bitmaps, so all the sprites in your sprite sheet, essentially, actually. animations per frame. So how fast you want the animation to step through, you can animate on twos, animate on three, animate on hundreds, it's up to you. Uh, frame index lower, so where do you want the animation to start from frame zero, one, two, etc. Frame index upper, the same fit idea, but the upper index, you can, I have made it so you can actually animate from a range. And then the, a reference to the main page, which is probably not too efficient because anything I need from the main page, I can just access it via the constructor. But it's there right now. So let's go to this function, see what's going on. It took me a tiny minute to write it, actually. I had to just kind of um, go through it a little bit. Very handy for me though, because every time I wanted to, uh, let's see that bunny running on left and right on the screen, every time I wanted to replace the asset, let's say I drew an even more amazing looking bunny, I would have to re basically write the animation code myself via loops, which I'm essentially doing, but having this animated sprites does just contain contains all that and encapsulates that information, that um, routine all in one, so I can access it really helpful for me it's actually saved me a lot of time so i have you know using frame references you know i'm stepping through 
um, can't really use for loops in this um, context because a for loop will increment in one update loop essentially whereas I'm actually I need to increment um, frame frame by frame according to the frames per second of the game so I had to do things kind of manually using if and else statements that's the way I came up with but here's the you can see the source code here that's basically the logic Let's see if there's any more then I have some um, properties uh, quite a lot of uh, reference to the input buffer Oh, sorry about that. Where am I going? Oh, that's a different... Uh... Oh, where am I? Yeah, sorry, yeah. And then that's where the function ends. I'm a little bit lost there. Oh, no, sorry. That's... What is this? Oh, it's a property. Sorry. Input buffer. That's an input buffer property. That's not part of the routine here. The routine ends here on this animation per frame index property. Sorry about that. Got a bit confused there. Am I right or am I wrong? I'm wrong. I'm, tired. I'm wrong. Sorry. Uh, this is the animated sprites function. And it ends here. So it's just um, three nests, like three tiers of if else. This is just, I got a bit confused by the bracketing. These are just other properties. Again, the framework is a bit messy here because I'm still, it's not finished. I'm still debugging it. So it saves time to just write things really quickly and stuff. Uh, where am I? So that's the animated sprites. It's really happy. So if we go back to the agenda, because I'm a little bit conscious of time. Let's attempt to load the metadata that we have stored to help us construct a particular asset, say like a platform, like a, like a, I don't know, the grid or something. So what we could do, the two main things we would need is a bounding rec struct. And I would suggest one way of loading the graphic is just to access the file path and reload reconstruct that using the animated resources so let's try it like that so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go to the main demo page i'm gonna have a quick uh, look at my xaml i'm gonna see if i can zoom in to make it more convenient for you guys to read i'm using boxes boxes are great as they use the uh, I think the fluent design, I think that's what Microsoft called it. So they they have they take advantage of um, different design um, advantages, you know, like resizing the controls, the children components within the view box control and stuff. So it just makes it look a bit neater, even though my I've used it in a very rough way. But let's say for example, let's make this really simple. I have somewhere a file menu, right? See if I can find that in my XAML. Once my computer catches up. Help menu tools, file menu. File menu item. I could do it the quick way. Let's see what's available to me here. I know you can add in the menu bar like a sub menu, I think. If I'm not mistaken. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a menu flyout sub item and a menu flyout item. Uh, let's go for the flyout sub item. I'm not too sure what that is, but I guess we might just find out if it's supported. Yeah, it seems to be fine. And uh, let's give it a name. Say name is um, I don't know um, save session and then, uh, let's make another one and we'll call it load session. It'll be very simple, just for sake of time. Let's see if I can keep the time. So this I should hopefully have a click event available to me. Not one that I can see. Or selection. Hmm. Let me see what's on the um, file menu bar if there's a click event. Or menu select. I'm sure there's one here somewhere. I'm just not finding it. Pointer press. Let's try that. Maybe that will help. Just do us fine.
Yeah, why not? There's the right tapped. There's probably a left tapped somewhere as well. No, there isn't. Okay, let's just go with um, point press. Hopefully that functions as a click event, basically. Oh, the event handler name save session pointer press is invalid. Hmm. The name may only contain letters, digits, and underscore character. Oh, of course, I left. Oh, I put a space. My bad. I should try it again. Um, what was it? Pointer press. Let's try one more time. Fine. So, I'm not mistaken, when the pointer, I use the mouse, basically, the mouse pointer, click the save session control. We're going to just very simply call my file IO class. Again, I'm making it very confusing because there's a namespace called file IO. Oh, whoops. I've actually clicked this already. I can just go ahead and reference it. Um, lowercase f. And that's my save data. Wait, for IntelliSense. Oh, did I change the name? I probably got it wrong. Let me just quickly check. Hopefully that's the local scope. Oh, it's not in global scope. So I'll just um, declare this in global scope. Which is my class, the O class that I made, which I should rename. I'll just put it here. Make it a private field. So now I have access to Farlio globally. I'm going to access my save functionality. So it's going to save metadata. And then I'm going to go back to the XAML. Oh my gosh, guys, I apologize. How long has that been with that? I had the screen up. I had the uh, mock up. I really do apologize. That was there for a minute <laughs> goodness so uh sorry about that i did not at all until just now i checked so let me recap everything in about a minute so all we're doing uh we're accessing the xaml so that we can use the editor layer to access the um what is it over here file io this file io class i made that saves the metadata of the rec structs and loads the metadata of the rec structs, and we can use the metadata to then reconstruct our scene. Really sorry about that. I didn't know until I just checked. I just thought I should check. Uh, so I'm going to hop back to the XAML and double check. That's better. Sorry about that, guys. Really do apologize. Anyway. Um, where am I? So in as much as we have a save session, let's deal with the load session. Pointer pressed. Hopefully it's the right event. And I'll just grab this and change the syntax. Oops. Load the metadata. To confirm these functions um, are functional. Uh, I'm not too sure why there's zero references to, the, to these. Maybe I have, to, I have to just build the file. Now, here's the thing. I want to go back to this because I was using placeholder information for, but I actually want to use the information in the scene I've constructed to um, to reconstruct the scene basically. So what can I do? I'm passing, I'm basically processing, I'm parsing this um, stage platforms at in this list of, of rects called stage platform index at zero. What we're going to do, not sure if I have to make use of a statement but I might be able to get away with this I'm gonna make a for loop within the range of the count of this rec list so let's see in index is sign zero what's wrong with this <laughs> index is incremented so we're incrementing, let's see if this works. Oops. So, uh, da, da, da. Hmm, 
that's weird. Oh, I did that wrong, sorry about that. So we're indexing, um, we're indexing this um, variable index up to the, from zero to the range of the count of recs that we're storing. We're doing this um, far right operation. So I'm gonna take away this hard-coded zero, put index in there. And let's see, let's load. Key things to load for the bounding recs would be the X value, so the X position. We also want the um, Y position. So we can reconstruct the platform, save as a bounding running a platform graphic. So let's go ahead and access the Y value and just the dimensions as well. So I think I believe that would be width and height. So I'm going to keep it fairly simple. And we're just casting the values to a string. So it can be written as a text, um, as te as text on the text file. And this is not really needed in particular, but let's just say, let's just describe what's going on here, just in case. So let's say, session really what I do is maybe like have a bit on the on the minus because of the funnel name of the session it comes up on the screen so just say session saved uh yeah that's fine actually session underscore saved uh scene metadata I'm just putting like random stuff here scene metadata rect structs stored you know ah, but then also we need the um the graphics themselves. So in my mind, I'm thinking we should pass the graphics, the necessary graphics we want to store, target it on disk and just read it from disk. Because obviously memory is volatile, storage is not so volatile. Um, so what can we do? Uh, in the constructors class, let's also add um, string. And let's just say sprite, did I spell that right? Sprite file path. Uh, let's see, uh, sprite file path. Where's my error? <laughs> I have an error here somewhere. And we're gonna pass, so every time we call the file IO, we have, every time we construct it, we have to pass it. Okay, but here's the issue. We shouldn't do that because obviously we need to pass the file path when we invoke the um, functionality that saves the data, not at construction, because we don't know what we're gonna be um, saving at that point, perhaps. So I'm gonna get rid of that. And I'm instead gonna put the, the file path parameter here. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, Why do we store it as a list? List of string. So that we can append the information through a string collection. This makes things a bit easier. Um, and in a similar vein, I'm gonna get this functionality. Oh, let's see what we do here. File. So on the same file, we can even have it on a different file, but let's keep on to the same one. Stage platforms, um, not stage platform, but now we want to store every file path of all the graphics that will be bounded on the racks. So we can take out all of this. And that should be okay, I think. We will keep the range accountable to the bounding rects, assuming that there are as many um, bounding rects in the scene as there are bitmap graphics for now, for the sake of simplicity. That obviously may not always be the case, but just for the sake of time. 
I've just got about 20 minutes, I think, for the stream, give or take. Hopefully, I can wrap things up by then. Uh, okay, so what we can do now, let's debug up to this point. I've also found that, um, yeah, okay, so we use debugging as the primary way of um, exposing our metadata. As I said, I think you can access the file directory under like developer mode if you activate it on your Windows machine or something. But for the sake of time, I'm not gonna do that right now if that's the case, don't even know if that's the way to do it. We're just gonna expose our metadata via debugging. So once again, everything will be uh, reconstructed into, let's say, it's funny. We could use a, a list of string Just for the sake of simplicity, we're gonna parse everything in one block of string. <laughs> Not the best way, it should actually be like maybe a collection and um, uh, separating each metadata in the list. But just for time, let's keep it this way and then we can just um, trim the string for the information we want or something. Is that the best thing, even, even for time? Uh, let, me, let me think for a minute. Uh, um, I let me see if I can, if there's like a read line or something. Oh, there is. So if we, I'm guessing, if we use read line async and we pass file, this text, we can then make a list of string, list of string text. equals new list of string. So we can construct the, the collection. I'm gonna take this line of code over there. I'm gonna then say text is equal to, oh, yeah. so what we're gonna do, we use a for loop. So we're gonna find the range for every um, line of text stored, if I can access such a value by um, property or something. Let's see if that's possible here, because we have here storage folder, maybe through file for index equals to zero. Oops, oh, oops. Int index is assigned zero. Let's just say file, what do we have access to here? Path name, file type, of, mm, what do we need? Like a length or count. This is available, so some kind of bool, I think. Okay, that's not what we want. I don't want to use a while loop, but I might have to just for the sake of time. It's a bit risky as well. Okay, so what I'll do, slightly more risky, but just quick. I'll put a clear catch. And let me just see, I'll take that up. This string doesn't contain a waiter, so we probably don't need this. But then that's a async functionality. Is there just read lines? That's, that's funny. Is it because of the list? With 
the string, it was fine. So I'll do. Just take this. Yep. Just so I don't get confused. Let's make a string called text. Oh, let's call it metadata. Metadata is assigned. Read lines async. Let's put the await there. It's very strange, but it was okay a second ago. I think I did something wrong. I obviously missed something. I was awaiting in the completely wrong place. Sorry about that, guys. So let me just redo. Mm -hmm. Let me move that. Of course, this should be here. And, uh... Ah, yeah, of course. Text, where's that? And then um, we're going to access it by index. store the element in the list and let's increment manually. I'm going to just create this value here. And let's see what's going on. So we have a list of string. Can basically convert list of string to string. Oh, of course. Reline async, what is this? Oh, okay, so it actually outputs a list of string inherently. So why don't I just, I don't need this, I think. Sorry guys, I'm not really talking much, but let me actually read it on. I'm not implicitly convert the type I, system collection generic. Um, I list string to system collection generic list of string. So that's a bit weird. There's an implicit conversion. Okay, tell you what, this, uh, this is very, probably very simple to sort. But I'm just going to literally just do this <laughs> because the time is ticking. Let's take this out. And then we'll go back to read text. And we're going to just debug the output. And then we don't need any of this. So yeah, just took you guys on a little ride though. <laughs> text is a new list of string. Maybe I didn't declare it properly, I don't know. I'm going to speed run this a little bit. This is fine. Just yeah. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> I confused myself. So we're just gonna basically stick to string text. Uh, I know I I know it's kind of a simple oversight, but uh, I do have to wrap up soon. I do want to at least expose the metadata. So what are we doing? Sorry for the silence as well. So anyway, what are we doing? Uh, we are accessing our uh, file in the count in the local folder directory. We're targeting schema one dot text, and we are basically um, storing the, the contents of the file onto this string. And for good measure, let's make it global. Reference there, so and we'll make it public. You no, know, it should be a public meth method exposing property or public property exposing a field, I guess. Public string um, meta 
Oh, that's a uh, beta. This actually has a string dot into it. And I'll just assign my string to global scope. So I'll do a break here. Now we, you, we need to make sure we're passing the correct information into the overload. So um, save metadata, we need to uh, have a list of all the file paths we're concerned with. And uh, a list of rects. I'm trying to find where I put that. Save metadata. I don't think I added that bit yet. So here we're using Sprite File Path. Oh yes, of course, platforms, which is a global. That's why I got a little confused. So we just have to make sure when we construct this class, we pass our rect function, our rect structs. A bit confusing, but at least that for now. So we're kind of speed running. So if I go here and add the overloads, I think I might actually have something already. I might have a list of recs, I'm not too sure. As for the file path, it would be this app domain, current domain, base directory, schemas, um, stage, the stage text file. list of rects I can use. I think I might, if not, I can just construct one quickly. Let me check the OBS again, as I made a mistake before with the screen sizes. Let me make sure everything's okay. Looks alright. Might be a bit hard to read, so I might zoom in. Uh, where am I? So I have a list. I have some lists. Any list of rats? Might just make one quickly. No, this is one quickly. Private list of rats. Let's call it rats. So simple. Equals list of rats. For the sake of demonstration, we're just gonna very intentionally pass specific rects. Oops. Oh, it's not async, so we'll get a bit of a warning, but it should be fine. Should compile and parse. It's our list of rec, our rec, rec to list. <laughs> going to just close my text. Oh yeah, of course, I did that wrong. See, I should really be passing the red list through the save metadata, but I did one construction of follow, which is not great. I even got confused. Again, because of time, I will just pass this. Again, I get a little confused. Uh, okay, so yeah, of course. I'm going to make this real simple because uh, this is just for a demo. So let's just make a string, a list of string, bitmap file paths. There's a new list of string. Then bitmap file paths, add. I'm going to add, just directly add this. Ah, uh, no, of course, I need to add the bitmaps, the, the file parts of the bitmaps stored in storage. This is not what we need right now. What I need is this. So my 
this time pass here, that's fine. Um, we have to decide what graphic we want to store. So of course, again, this is for the sake of time. I'm going to go and look for an arbitrary file path. Let's go for... I kind of like the pixely um, hill. I don't know what it was called. Let's so find it. Wall one? Was it one? I don't think it was. I'll go for the grid. Go for the grid background. So just the ground plane. A checkerboard graphic. Go down. I'm going to add the file path. So um, the program will access this file path that stores the grid graphic. Add it to a list. And then it will save the, it will then pass the list into my save to data function so there's a target directory um, now what I need to do is go to the instantiation of this file IO which I think is in the constructor which isn't the best form but it's, it will do for now and I'm passing the ret list just have a look at that ah, okay so I already made a ret list which is funny and um it's kind of placeholder. It's, it's very, it's very placeholder. So what I'll do, I'll keep this here, and I will just reassign its values. So instead of these placeholder rects, I'll actually put the rects that I'm using at the moment. I think I made another. No, I didn't. I thought I made two members called rectless, but I would have got an error if I did. I think. Unless that was in a different scope. Where am I? Uh, where was I just now? Because I think that red list is out of scope. Yeah, so I'm going to get this. Because this is under the constructor, I think. So now I'm looking at the red list in global scope. So I'm going to add some recs. And the main recs, which I just remember off by heart, is I have a rec called player rect. But because we're storing the graphic for the ground plane, let's use the player the rect I'm using storing the ground plane. It'll be ground plane rect. Ground plane rect has been added to the rec list. And um, uh, once we construct file IO, which should be in the constructor, I think, of my program, let me just double check this there. Yep. Pass the right, it's all fine and dandy. Instead of calling load metadata on the constructor level of the program, why don't we call load on the um, user input? Calling file load metadata here. I'm not too sure why the reference is zero there, it's kind of strange. Uh, let's see, no overloads needed for that. It's all in the metadata schema. And let's do a little bit of debugging. Like, I missed some stuff. We won't have time to load the scene itself, I'll show you guys, but uh, I have time to at least expose the metadata so we can have a little look, which will give the general idea. Let me see. I'm gonna to go to the file by your glass. Do I have a break anywhere? I think I do. So let's serialize this. Um, serialize. Let's put a break there. And if we have any errors, we'll deal with them accordingly. Make sure the references are there. Set. I'm gonna load with symbols loaded. We're gonna load in debug mode. I'm gonna quickly check OBS. Okay, it's looking fine. I'm going to check the agenda as well. Because I want to continue from here for the next stream. So yeah, we're loading the metadata to reconstruct game editor sessions. We'll have time to actually display it, but we'll be at least loading the metadata. So uh, let's go back. So obviously when you load a Visual Studio project with um, the symbols loaded for debugging, it's a little slower to load. Uh, oh, it's all well and good. Just 
just wait for Visual Studio. And yeah, I'm having a lot of fun with Win2D. Um, in terms of graphics program, I've been using a mix of SlimDX, um, experiment with SlimDX. I have a video or two on how to utilize, utilize some functionality of SlimDX, which is a DirectX wrapper. It's deprecated, and um, it actually says on Nougat that I should use SharpDX instead, which is like basically the same thing, but a different package. However, because of the sake of time and things, I, I stick with um, SlimDX. Um, I'm used to it. And I just use it for kind of educational purposes anyway. So, but I'm going to use Sharp DX. It's more feature complete, if I can say. Uh, I'm just going to see what's going on here. Should hopefully not take too much time. I'm here in the UK and um, it's really, it's been quite hot for the last couple of days or so. Like really hot. My place is sports after this. <laughs> Balance out my day. Just waiting for this to load. Let me sip on my coffee. Um, so yeah, I what I'll do on the agenda I have here section called wrap up and i'm going to go through where you can find my work because um i do want to make um in as much as i reach milestones i do want to make some capacity of my work accessible and i'm going to be showing you some handles where that will be the case so i think my project is just about coming through the deploy has succeeded which is good so far I won't zoom in the code right now because we're going to be looking at the functionality really afterwards. It really won't take too much more time. I'm aware it's about one, three o'clock now. Just gone three. That's BST, British Summertime time. <laughs> summertime. Um, so yeah, I'm going to let this load. I'm going to invoke the functionality. Hopefully. That event I did is hooked correctly so that when I press down with my mouse, it will actually save the schema. I didn't put a break, so I might put a break there so we can test it as well. Let me go back to the code. I put a break on the load, but not the save. Okay, so I'll just wait for this to stabilize a little bit. Heads up as well, I had this thing whereby a lot of my storage space on disk was being eaten up by NuGet cache um, information. I cleared my NuGet cache, I had like 7 gigabytes of space cleared, and it was pretty useful for me because the computer is more of a workstation than like say a gaming machine. Um, so it doesn't have much hard disk space stock, but I'm using what's available and I'm using another, part, um, another disk, um, so a different drive basically. For all my other stuff. It's running fairly slow. I do appreciate there's quite a few some software running in the background in, in the form of OBS and YouTube on my browser. So it's not running at optimal speed, of course. Using my keyboard controls because I don't have access to a um, Microsoft controller. Let's just I'll just show you again. So we have this very simple to scene. So much can be done, you know, you can add um, collision detection. You can add jump animations, which I'm actually in the process of doing. Just so a world of possibilities. I'm gonna hit file, see if I've done this right. Uh, fairly, but not quite. <laughs> There's, I, I didn't set the text itself, so we can't really see what's going on. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and click that. Uh, uh, so now I have to click this one or that one. Maybe it's not the event. Oh, I didn't even I didn't I didn't set a break, so we, we don't actually let's try that one more time. It might not be the right events that I set at all. I just kind of guessed. Otherwise, we had the break. So what I'll do? Uh, I'll just do it on construction or 
maybe when the form closes, just make things simple. When you close the form, it should save hopefully. So what I'll do, um, I'll go back to the XAML. I will um, wait for my program to just kind of stabilize. I'll go up to page. There should be a form closing event, if I'm not mistaken. Something like that. I think it's unloaded that I want. Excuse me. So uh, I'm going to save. I'm going to save functionality here. So when I close the page, I automatically save the metadata. And I'm going to close on the. Um, it's, un it's not real. I, I want to call this on construction just for speed because we're going to wrap up the stream in a, in a second. What I'm going to do, because the file doesn't exist yet, not too much, we'll get an exception. I don't want to call load before anything has been saved. So I'm going to just comment that out first. Going to run without debugging for speed. Ooh, that was quite loud. <laughs> My hand's clicking. And um, yeah, I'm going to unload the form, the page once it's loaded, which should invoke the save functionality, hopefully. I'll just double check OBS. It shouldn't take too much longer. Deploy succeed, it should be loading soon. Here we go. Okay, so I'll wait for the scene to load anyway. Some short resources are here. Move the bunny up again, <laughs> shift him around. And then I will unload the page. I'm not sure anything broke there. We get a break. Oh, wallet. Well, I didn't set a break in the page on load. But save meta should have broke. Oh, but I was not in debug mode. That's why. That's fine. What we want to do is actually evaluate the load method. So I'm going to put break here. And I'm going to run in debug. Hopefully what should have happened is, because I was running in non-debug mode, um, the save functionality succeeded. Now we're going to evaluate the um, stream holding the metadata. Hopefully we should get some information pertaining to the rec struct and its position and dimensions. Um, let's see. Where am I calling this again? I don't know. Uh, oh, snap. No, whoops. So, oh yeah, I commented it out. So, sorry guys. So a bit of a session. Coding. I'm gonna scroll here. I'm gonna uncomment load metadata. First I'm gonna stop the program. Uncomment this so we can call it. I'm gonna go to my file and uh, make sure my break is set properly. That should be fine. I'm gonna run the debugging. Hopefully this works. But then again, ah uh, gosh. Saved on the schema. I was worried that the it will load some objects, the rec struct, before they're constructed. We're not concerned with the rec objects per se, we're concerned with the schema text file, which is of course populated already, so it should be fine. I was sticking ahead a little bit, getting confused. Excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> So we have the code breaking here. Let's evaluate text. Once the uh, my program D just we just do that catches up with me. Hmm. Interesting. So not quite what I expected. It seems I haven't actually overwritten the file. It's got the old information. So I'm gonna make sure we are actually calling save metadata 
I'm going to put a break here. Make sure that we're hitting schema underscore one, schema underscore one, which we're loading successfully. And we're going to see what's going on. Let's uh, go to the main page. And you know what? <laughs> Will be interesting. I'm suspecting this might not be, this main page might not be calling, but it should do. But then, would the resources be available? Want to show? No, I'll do. Let's make this very simple. Not at construction, but let's just put it when we move. This is purely for debug purposes. So, for example, if I press the W key, let's make it S for save, <laughs> it makes sense. If I press the S key, this is purely for debug purposes, so uh, it's not really in a function. It will function, but it's not in the best of form. But what I'm doing is essentially saying when I um, click S, I will call the serialized functionality. So let's just hope that works. And then we'll wrap the stream, hopefully in the next 10 minutes. Hope you guys have enjoyed so far this very um, general and light overview. Should hopefully pass on the general idea with this particular framework. It's very much in its beginning stages. So we'll call it load, which is okay. Um, but of course, we're loading the old metadata. Oh, what happened? Hmm, Probably didn't run out of memory. Maybe it was a bug or something. It would have been caught if it was an exception. Would have broken. I don't know why. I had some memory issues that was crashing my deployments. Hopefully that's not the case because I don't want to have to deal with storage space on my main disk. It should be fine. Everything's here. I'm going to go ahead and just move the bunny slightly. Hit S. Oh, whoops. I didn't actually, it wasn't active, so let's do that now. Here we go. So we've broke, the code is broken. Is stepping through line 41 of my file class and um, for the sake of speed let's just go straight to the bottom so we know it's um, invoking this function let's hope it's no errors let's put that there Here, take this one out. Okay. So we are, I think we're stepping to line 59. A lot of computation on my PC. You can definitely hear that fan spinning. Stepping through the code. System cannot find the file, so I'll probably have a file in the wrong. So I have here. Oh goodness, that's wrong. So stage platforms dot count is seventy one. So what we're gonna do? This is only one platform I wanna save for the sake of demonstration. Get rid of that. just verify I'm gonna uh, home in on zero because we're only saving if you remember that the struct the rec struct holding the um, platform and I'm just going to check 
um, stage platform to make sure we are in constructing this correctly. Let's stop that. in on this reference just so I can go straight to where I need to go I have 395 on my main threat list I just want to double check make sure I'm instantiating that correctly I'm going to reload the code this might be the last attempt I do for the stream because of the time. Hopefully, I hit the bullseye here with my code. Oh, you know what's funny? I'm, I'm calling the right text async when really I should probably be calling right a It may still load the metadata as a string, but it may not be in a very friendly format if I'm not pending the string. We'll see what happens. Let's move the body a little bit. Let's go ahead and hit X. Oops. I think that's a cool. Okay. That's very strange. So it seems we hit a exception or something because we didn't get to the bottom. Let's just step through this one by one and see how it's okay. Now I'm going to place it in here. Was it naive of me to call a file IO stream? Goodness. To call a stream operation in such a manner. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set a break here, I'm going to invoke my function, I'm going to see if I can do everything in one fell swoop. So I think probably what's the simplest way to do this is just to go like this. Mm. Not the most elegant, but it might just get the job done. So we have X and Y. Let's go ahead and save the height of the rect. Please save the width, so now it's the height. Yeah, that's okay. Which means we don't need to repeat these lines of code. What was this one? Sprite file. Okay. Because right. this, uh, if I just look at this right text async file, which is the file path itself stored on the stream, so I suspect I don't really need this. It might have actually been an error. I may have written this an error. So I'll do I'll reload the file, reload the program. And hopefully this is the 
this squid amendment. Oh, I forgot something. I didn't get rid of this line. 47. So we're storing x, y, width and height. But I'm going to get rid of that as well. Oh, goodness, what's going on? Oh, thank goodness I have an error. Oh, no. Okay, I've got an error. Let's see what's going on. So I want to delete line 47 because I've already uh, assigned the y value. So what I do? Go up. I will just delete this. I think I need it. Just move that up. My step through. That's funny, it deployed even with an error or something. I think it's a uh, innate error I had there. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. This was the last one. If this, this doesn't work, um, it's fine because we still confirm the schema written at the beginning of the stream um, for the sake of time if we can't get it up now it will be for the next stream to load the bit of data and construct it onto the scene but hopefully we can at least um, get some of that metadata of the right here because the concepts always be shown in the beginning of the video of the stream so wait for the scene to come up scroll the bunny here okay let's step through It's just a bit hesitant stepping through like stream operations, but it should be okay for you. Yeah, it's kind of strange there, but I'm gonna trust everything's alright. I don't really like stre um, stepping through streams, streaming operations, but that's fine. Let me close it. Ah, oh, here we go. Because now it's saving a spit, but I already hit close, so I'm not too sure what happened. So let's run it one more time. I know I said this will be the last time. This will truly be the last time. Of course I need to load it all. Of course I need to show you guys the metadata. It's the overall last time. Last time I'm saving, then it'll be the last time I'm loading. Whether or not it works, I promise. So that's saved. Now I'm gonna just put a break while I load. Hopefully, I've, there's a reference, two references. One is valid, one isn't. Um, so hopefully, we hit the, the valid one. So uh, if I've made any functional errors, uh, then obviously we won't see the right metadata. But I'm seeing some values, and they look about right. So if we look here, hard to see. I appreciate. I'm going to check my OBS again. I'll read it out just in case. But we have the value 262.6321 um, and there's a lot more numbers. We have 1920 and 1080, which is actually the value of the background rect. I set that to 1920 to 1080 to match uh, a default value for the screen that I remember. Uh, and it ends there, which is strange. I think what I've done is that I've concatenated all the other values, which is like this jumble of 14111113281. I've just concatenated them all because obviously here, I stored it as one string, concatenating them just like that. So all the Y width and height, it's just, it's, it looks, appears as one string, 262.6314111113281. But that's all the individual values I just, Poor, like, as, as I said before, poorly formatted. But that brings us to the end of the stream somewhat, because I want to wrap up with a few things. We have shown that you can have an editor layer um, at runtime, store metadata, and load it on a different session, which is very exciting stuff. We can do some fun things with that in terms of uh, game frameworks and engines. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to hop to the agenda. And since we 
did successfully load the metadata, I'm going to mark that as complete. So for the next episode, which we didn't get to today, we're going to build a simple UI or build on top, continue from the UI. Uh, we're going to have it so, um, well, I've written here all the editor session functions from the editor. We didn't really do that quite, so we'll do that from the editor next time. And we'll do some other fun stuff. So let's wrap up. Uh, where to find my work and next episode. So obviously I upload on here on YouTube. I have a Fiverr page, which I'll leave a link in the description. So um, I do have a particular gig, which does look a little bit at this kind of functionality more in the description. I have my LinkedIn, my portfolio, my websites. So feel free to have a browse there. Uh, and uh, next episode, I'm going to be building on this. I want to maybe make on the top of the agenda, maybe I'll work on this a bit off screen to tidy it up. But then so we can actually start on placing a rectruct, um, so even the metadata which we've done, but then reconstructing that particular rect so you can really see it on the UI. I think that'll be quite fun that we just build from there. So my name is William. Hope you enjoyed this little stream and I hope to see you next time. Have a great day. Bye bye. Just going to sign off my OBS. Not sure if I do it from YouTube or not. I'll do it from YouTube, not from OBS. I think it's a better way to do it. See if I can just uh, actually, guys, <laughs> I'm still getting used to this setup, so I'll just press up, I guess. Mm, no, 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 no. End the stream. Take care.